you have called us in your life your light uncovered the world to see now you alone have made a way for us in your love you are life I'm living in the light of my Savior and welcome to the Rivers online worship experience. I am so glad that you are here with us today and you are in for quite a treat. Every once in a while, we get to film somewhere that I've been hoping to film, that I've been wanting to film and everything lines up and we're able to film at a particular place. And you may be saying, well, Dean, where are you filming today? Well, we are filming today inside the pit pen recycling building that you see uh, between the concrete plant and the air products plant in Creighton on, I believe it's Freeport Road. Now, the reason I say I believe it's Freeport Road because in Western Pennsylvania in this area, every north-south road is called Freeport Road regardless of the town that you're in. So I'm so grateful that you have chosen to join in with us today. And I am standing next to a mound of shredded office paper. So if you ever uh, notice companies picking up shredded paper or uh, confidentially they will pick up your paper uh, from a work site and then they shred it and then they bring it here and then at the recycling center here, they take this and they bale it together and then they sell it across the country. 
And I'm so grateful for my friend John Stanzione and his willingness, uh, along with his brother Brad, to allow us to film here. So good news. I know some of you uh, like to recycle. And in New Kensington, we recycle glass and tin and aluminum and anything metal, uh, but we don't recycle plastics. So they will take your plastics here. You separate them between uh, plastic category one and plastic category two, uh, and they want you to go to the website or call them, and they will give you more information about how to separate the plastics into the two categories that will work for them. Uh, also, they are going to be starting once again recycling cardboard, I've been told. I haven't verified, but uh, if you're in the city of New Kensington, good things are happening. And they are open to individuals that want to recycle newspaper or other things. Uh, feel free to reach out to them, and they will help with all of your recycling needs. Now, I love, as you know, I love filming next to things that make me look small. And so when we saw this mound of shredded office paper, we're like, we got to film here. And so here we are. Oh, I'm also wearing their t-shirt in case you're like, why is he in another t-shirt? I'm wearing their t-shirt. I'll even show you the back of it. There it is. Got their logo right there. Okay. <laughs> Not funny business. <laughs> But you're like, Dean, that wasn't really that funny. Uh, I got it. I got it. So we are in part three of our series of messages, just simply called Lost Cause. And we're focusing on Jesus' mission, where in Luke chapter 19, he made it very clear, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, this is the cause that Jesus came for. This is everything he did, everything he said, everything he taught, every person he healed. It was with this mission in mind. Every person he recruited to uh, follow him, time and time and time again, Jesus is speaking and saying, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. And so I want to let you know that this series is designed to help us be God's witnesses because the mission that we are called to is the same mission that Jesus lived. We are called to seek and to save the lost. Now, maybe you can hear some of the background ambient noise. I'm not sure, but the radio communication going on is very uh, interesting to hear a very loud conversation happening while I'm preaching here as well. So I think they're uh, trying to figure out how to turn that down. So uh, good deal, guys. Um, so today, in our calling to be a witness, we're going to look at the power of story. Now, I love this subject because I notice that I am moved by people's stories. I am moved by stories, and I love to tell stories. And so today, we're going to look at the power of story. Now, the reality is sometimes we are not exposed to story. Sometimes we, we don't hear stories. Uh, my friend told me something that uh, just broke my heart. He said, Dean, I, I hear you talking about the books your mom read to you when you were a kid and the, the stories that you heard read to you. He said, that wasn't my experience. I can never remember being read to as a child. And I just thought, wow, how, how much has he missed as a child in his childhood? And today, we're going to look at the power of story and the power that your story can have in witnessing. You're like, but I don't have a story. I don't, I don't have any kind of story. I, I, you know, I wasn't a drug dealer. I wasn't a, you know, a gangster. I wasn't a, you know, and then I came to faith in Christ and everything changed. I was, I don't, I don't have a story. Well, uh, yes, yes, you do. And today, 
we're going to kind of have as the backdrop of this message some of the movements in people's stories to pay attention to, to look for. Because not only are we looking at the power of your story, but we're looking at the power of other people's story when they share it with you, where you can look for God's movement and God's working. And so today, we're going to look at what is commonly believed to be the most profound story that Jesus ever told. The story that's in Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. The story of the prodigal son. And in this story, there are five kind of moments where this son has an awakening And I I want you to listen to these five kind of awakenings that he has and then look at how when you engage with people that might be far from God, how, how you can see their awakening to these things in their story and their lives as well. So let's jump in. The first awakening is the awakening to longing this longing, this yearning. The story begins there, Jesus continued, there was a man who had had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. The prodigal son became dissatisfied with his life and felt he was missing out on something better. Did you ever experience that in your life? Or perhaps you know someone who's in the middle of wrestling with that. The prodigal son's quest to satisfy his longings sent him on a journey toward fun, a fast-paced life, and the excesses of the culture that surrounded his family. This desire for more, this longing, it gets people too often to begin their search for meaning. Do do you see yourself in this story? Well, now there's kind of another awakening that takes place. Uh, Verse 14 begins kind of with the awakening to regret. The son decided to lean into his longings and throw caution to the wind and pursue fun wholeheartedly. But that kind of opens up an awakening to regret. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. After his pursuit of the good life lets him down, the prodigal awakens to the reality that his choices separated him from his father, his family, and stability. He pursued his primitive longings without God and eventually found himself alone, directionless, and confused. During this awakening, we find ourselves saying, I wish I could start over. We dream about returning to points in the past, what might have happened if only we had made better choices. Now, pay attention to this. Many people get stuck in repeating these first two awakenings. Uh, they, They have this longing, this craving, this yearning. And so they set out to fulfill it with all that energy that they can muster and then when that leaves them empty hollow 
with very little meaning in their life, that they come face to face with this awakening to regret. And then they pursue that longing again, and it's a cycle of longing and regret and longing and regret and longing and regret. This repetition is the sorry cycle. Pursuing God-given longings, God-given longings outside of a relationship with God, which leads to regrettable decisions and actions. Many people get stuck in the sorry cycle for months, some for years, and some others, they never escape it. As we process through this story of the prodigal son, I, I want to give you a quick take on it by the skit guys. The skit guys uh, put together great videos that tell stories in a refreshing, modern way. Uh, I want to invite you to enjoy this video by the skit guys, just simply called The Prodigal. And then after this video, I'll come back and share the other three, the next three longings. Let's enjoy this video together. You ever get tired of your just boring day-to-day -day life? I do. I should say I did. Then I decided to do something about it. Conventional wisdom says you live your life, you grow up, your parents die, they leave an inheritance for you. That wasn't working for me. I wanted to enjoy that inheritance now, so I decided to do something about it. So one day, I walked straight up to my dad, looked him square in the eye, and I said, Dad, I want what's coming to me right now. That's what my youngest son said to me. At that moment, all I could think of was, I'd like to give what's coming to him right now. But he's my son, and I love him. And as much as it put an ache in my heart, I gave him the money, and I told him that he could go search for a life on his own. Not long after that, he packed his bags, and the next thing I knew, I was out of there. The friends, the food, the clothes, it was, it was great. Until my son's money ran out around the same time the country hit a recession. It was bad, really bad. I'd squandered everything my dad had given me, and uh, I, I didn't have anywhere to live, anything to eat. So it was, this hunger pains is a constant reminder of how I'd squandered my life away. I, I lived in agony day after day. day. After day after day, I would watch and I would wait. And my heart would ache as only a heart can from a parent to a child. But hear me on this. I never once gave up on my child. I knew that he would come back one day. One day it hit me. I realized my dad's lowliest worker was living like a king compared to me. So I had an idea. See, I would go up to him and, and I would humbly just ask him for a job. I, I couldn't expect him to take me back as his son, but maybe he would give me a job, just maybe. It was a beautiful day. I was sitting there on the porch, just enjoying the cool breeze. And that's when I saw him. He stood up, he, he looked, in my direction, and he squinted his eyes to kind of get a better look at me. I wondered if he would take me back. And then my dad jumped off the porch. You know what I did next? I ran. I'd never seen him run so fast. He, he, he was like, he was like this kid who was excited about something. And then, and then I realized he was excited about me. My heart was pounding so fast, I just had to get to him. He was running at me with his arms stretched out as if to say, welcome home. Welcome home, welcome home. And as I got closer to him, I could, I could see tears in his eyes. My dad was crying. Tears of joy. And you know what my boy did next? He jumped. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I, I jumped right into my dad's arms and you know what he did? Well, I fell backwards. He, he's a big boy. He held me. He held me like only a father could. 
I just kept saying to him over and over again, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't deserve to be called your son. My son. My son is home. Get him some clean clothes. Get, get him some shoes for his feet. Let's prepare a meal. No. No. Let's prepare a feast. For my son will no longer live as an orphan. Today we will celebrate, for all my hopes have come true. I guess so. Uh, I guess it was hope. Hope that kept me going all those days. Hope that my father would show me mercy. Hope that somehow he would take me back and that I could be forgiven. Forgiven. It is all forgiven. It is forgotten. And I will never bring it up again. There is no anger. There is no shame. There is no blame. All that's left is just pure joy. For my child was lost. And now he's found. I hope you enjoyed that video and the quick hit, quick take on the prodigal son. I wanted to show you that I'm filming in front of today uh, on the second part of this message, stacks and stacks of bailed candy boxes. Now I have not eaten dinner yet, but there's Hershey, 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 Hershey. And all of a sudden I've gotten very hungry. So let's go, let's get this done. Um, so there's this awakening of longing this awakening, uh, the second awakening is the awakening of regret. But now where it shifts from getting stuck in that cycle is when you come to the awakening of help. Do you, do you know, do you have any idea how few people are willing to ask for help? Especially people that are successful because we are, we are called to you know, be resourceful and industrious and work it out and, and not to rely on other people. And, and I have a friend in my life that anytime he calls me and asks me for help, I will turn over heaven and earth to help him. Do you know why? Because he hardly ever asks. And when he does, I know he really, really needs my help. Well, we see in the life of this son now, this awakening to help. He says in verse 17, it says my favorite line in scripture just about, it says when he came to his senses, he had an awakening. He came to his senses. He realized his eyes were open. What am I doing? He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare. And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. We don't have to live very long on earth to realize that we're just really not able and we can't live our lives on our own. After repeating the sorry cycle of trying to fulfill these longings without God and ending up with regret over and over again, we have the opportunity to acknowledge that something has to change. We have to get help. That's what I love about uh, the recovery uh, movement in Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous is they come and say, wait, I'm not able to fix this myself. I need someone greater than me to help me. Well, we find this son coming to this place. We come to the end of ourselves and say, I can't do this on our own, my own. We hit rock bottom. We come to our senses. We need help. And that help is Jesus. It really is. In the prodigal son, we see this realization unfold when he says, 
And when it says he came to his senses, where he was on the farm, where he was working after losing all his money and possessions and fighting the pigs for scraps of food, he realized his father's servants had it better. They had a better situation than he did and realized he needed to return home. He will express his regret and ask his father for a role as a servant. And then comes the fourth awakening, this awakening to love. Check out what happens. Verse 20, so he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son through his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Jesus is the one that leads us back to the Father. As we come back to God, we find that we're ambushed by grace. This was not the reception that the son had anticipated. He was all ready to bargain. Well, I don't have to, I, don't look at me as your son, just, just as a servant. But he was ambushed by the grace of the father. And he discovers that God's, that God's love is overwhelming. And God loves us deeply after all. However, a shadow of shame and guilt follows him home and follows us home. And we struggle to believe we're loved just as we are. As the prodigal approaches home after a long season away, he sees the father running toward him and then experiences the warm embrace of love. But notice that his immediate response is not that of accepting the love. He doesn't return the father's affection. His first response is confession. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But once that confession is made, our hearts open up so wide to experience and receive the grace and love and forgiveness that the Father offers. The final movement, and again, these movements are in your story, my story, and even people that are far from God, it's in their story. Listen for them so you can speak into them. The final awakening is the awakening to life. The awakening to life. I love that Evanescence song from over 20 years ago where uh, the singer of Evanescence is crying out, bring me to life. And this son has an awakening to life. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. And then listen to this. For this, my, this, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The prodigal's father celebrates his return. The return of his son with a feast of celebration, recognizing that what was lost had been found, what was thought dead was now alive. When Jesus offers his followers, life in all of its fullness. We are offered life in deed. We are offered life to the full. As we experience this final awakening, we realize 
Now this is living. Now, you know, I said, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't get, like, what does this have to do with the power of story? Well, listen, you've heard a powerful story about someone, and you may have been able to see yourself in the story. That's part of the power of story, that you're able to see yourself in the story. But even more, what's powerful about story is you're able to connect others and see them in the story and help them see them in the story. You're able to see the awakenings and the movements in the story of their life and you are able to speak into that and, and say, don't you think it's, it's time maybe that you move from the sorry cycle of longing and then regret and longing and regret, but do you move toward love and life, that you move toward all that the Father has for you so as promised i, I want to speak to us about telling our story and i'm just going to wrap this up real quick uh, when you have the opportunity to share your story with someone who desperately needs to hear it someone that's far from God, someone that's been hurt by the church, somebody that's walked away from family, somebody that's walked away from God, somebody that's walked away from all that he has for them, and, and you get to share your story. I just want you to do three things. First of all, I want to invite you that your story, I want you to pay attention how your story begins where you were. Describe your life before Jesus. Hey, this is what I was like before I came to faith in Christ. Now, for those of us that were raised in church, I, I gave my life to Christ when I was a five-year-old little kid. I didn't have a lot of murder, and I didn't have a lot. I mean, the worst thing I did was I caught a, a small snake, and I put it in a container and left it out in the sun, and it died like an hour later. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a, you know, a laundry list of horrible tragic crisis kind of sins and uh, uh, you know a whole path behind me of carnage I was five <laughs> okay I lived out in the country um, but I in describing what my life was like before Christ I will I will look at that period in my life when I was going my own way and choosing my own thing and what my life was like during that period of time. Because even if we've walked with Christ for some time, we've had those times, those seasons, that, that we're just doing what we want to do with little thought or regard to what God has for us. So describe your life before Jesus. And then secondly, share how you met Jesus. How did, you, how did you meet Jesus? Well, it was the craziest thing. I started dating this girl and then she introduced me, to, took me to church and then I, I found Christ and man, everything changed. I was baptized and, and I, I'm, I'm <laughs> still the same person, but I'm a new person. It's all different. I see things different. I value things differently. I'm experiencing that abundant life. Share how you came to meet Jesus. And then finally, share what following Jesus means to you. Now, one, one, one thing that you may notice about me when I preach and just in my life in general is I, I don't hesitate to share my failures because <laughs> I still have them. I still mess up. I still fail on the moral spectrum. <laughs> now, when I do, I don't get stuck there. I don't lose my mind in shame because Jesus paid the penalty for that. And so I come to him with a contrite spirit and just, geez, I'm, I'm so sorry that I put that before you, that I chose that ahead of you. And I ask you to forgive me and allow your spirit to, be fresh in my soul again. And when we share the difference that Jesus is making in our lives today, don't give some simple Sunday school, you know, 
lighthearted answer. Be honest. Be authentic. Because you have a story. And your story matters to God. And your story matters to the kingdom. And so I want to invite you. Share your story. Share your story shamelessly and see how people respond. If they're like, oh, God, I don't want any of that, then, then maybe we need a little coached on sharing your story. Because each of us that are followers of Christ, regardless of where we are in our journey, have a story to share that can help draw others to him. May you experience the power of story. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Cannot wait till I get to see you again. Have a great week.